Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast with Charlie State and Naga Monchetti. Our headlines today. Nigel Farage's Brexit party claims an overwhelming victory, taking the lion's share of the vote across the UK in the European elections. If we don't leave on October the 31st, then the scores you've seen for the Brexit party today will be repeated in a general election and we are getting ready for it. The Conservatives suffer the worst performance since 1832, pushed into fifth place, while Labour is punished for a lack of clarity over Brexit. The Comeback Kids, a surge of support for the Liberal Democrats, which claim second spot, and a victorious night for the Greens, making significant gains. Good morning. Lewis Hamilton describes his victory in Monaco as the hardest one yet, as he dedicates his fourth win this season to triple world champion Nicky Lauda, who died on Monday. Good morning. We've got rain slipping south across the northern half of the country, but for most today, it's a day of sunshine and showers. The driest conditions the further south that you travel, and it's going to feel cooler. I'll have more in 15 minutes. Good morning. It's Monday the 27th of May. Our top story this morning. Labour and the Conservatives have paid the price for their indecision over Brexit, suffering huge losses in the European elections. The newly formed Brexit party took a 32% share of the vote. The pro-EU Liberal Democrats finished above the Conservative party for the first time ever. So let's take a look at the results in detail. Nigel Farage's Brexit party formed, of course, just six weeks ago was the runaway winner, gaining 28 seats. At the opposite end of the Brexit divide, also a good day for the Liberal Democrats, which now has 15 MEPs. Now, looking at each party's shares of the votes, it makes it clear just how bad a night it was for the Conservatives, receiving less than 10%, the worst performance in an election since 1832. Looking at the change in numbers from the last EU election, you can see just where some of those Brexit party seats came from, taking over nearly all of the UKIP vote, as well as undoubtedly some of that big 15% loss for, of, for the Conservatives. Yes, you want some more detail on those uh, results, or maybe to find out exactly what happened where you are, uh, you can go to the BBC News website or some more information there. Here's our political correspondent, Nick Hurtley, with a roundup of the results so far. Just a warning, his report does contain some flashing images. A vote that wasn't supposed to take place to a parliament we're supposed to have left. A result that shows the country is still bitterly divided. The big winners, two parties with very different but very clear messages on Brexit. Brexit, Brexit now! Nigel Farage's Brexit party topped the poll with almost a third of the vote. The reason, of course, is very obvious. We voted to leave in a referendum. We were supposed to do so on March the 29th, and we haven't. The Liberal Democrats, with their anti-Brexit message, had a big night too, coming second across the UK. Every vote for the Liberal Democrats is a vote to stop Brexit. For the two parties that normally dominate British politics, it was a disaster. The Conservatives were thumped, finishing fifth with less than 10% of the vote. Three years ago, the country voted to leave. It's three years on and we haven't left. And inevitably, therefore, people were going to be drawn in a polarised way to the kind of single-issue pro- or anti-Brexit parties. Labour too were punished, finishing third with less than 15%. That'll spark a heated debate about whether it should now get fully behind another referendum. We're now going to find ourselves in a position where we will have a Tory leadership who will insist on either a bad deal or no deal at all. And I fear it will be no deal. And in those circumstances, we must be equally clear. And it will be a disaster for our country to have no deal. There should be a referendum and we should campaign to remain. <laughs> The Green vote was up too. They beat the Conservatives into fourth place. UKIP were wiped out and Change UK failed to make their mark. In Scotland, the SNP were miles ahead on almost 40%. The party will take three of the six seats there. In Wales, the Brexit party topped the poll. Plaid Cymru came second. Labour, a party who have dominated Welsh politics for a century, finished third. Northern Ireland counts today. 
It was a good night for parties who have taken a firm stand on Brexit, but voters are still split between parties who back leaving the EU as soon as possible and those who want another referendum and ultimately to stay. If you were hoping this would end the Brexit debate, you may well be disappointed. McGarry, BBC News. Our political correspondent Tom Barton is in Westminster for us this morning. Tom, good morning to you. So, I mean, what is this showing? What a reflection when it comes to who's voted for who? Well, yeah, this was without doubt, Naga, a terrible night for the two main parties, between them getting fewer than half the votes they won in 2014. What voters do want, though, is far from clear. Yes, a victory for the Brexit party, getting around a third of the vote, but those parties which stood on a clear Remain platform, the Lib Dems, the Greens, the Scottish and Welsh Nationalists, between them, well, they got a larger share of the vote. What then does this mean for politics here in Westminster? Well, until now, Labour and the Conservatives have each, in their own way, been walking the tightrope of compromise positions, which have, well, clearly gone down badly with voters. And so for the Conservatives, in the midst of a leadership election, candidates are likely to find themselves under pressure to toughen up their Brexit positions. For Labour, well, pressure will grow on the party to line up behind another referendum. Both of those, though, are likely to alienate parts of their electorate. Nothing really about these results provides an easy solution to the dilemmas facing the political parties. Mm, OK, Tom, thanks very much. And we're going to be talking to representatives from all the political parties this morning. Well, early indications from the European parliamentary elections suggest a fall in support for established centrist parties. Yes, there have been gains for those on the left and right, as well as the Greens. Voter turnout was sharply up on the last elections. That was five years ago, of course. We'll speak to our Paris correspondent, Hugh Schofield, in a moment. First, though, let's go to Brussels. We can speak to our Europe correspondent there, Damien Grammaticus. Damien, morning to you. Just uh, give us a sense of the big picture over there. Obviously, we've been largely focusing on uh, the UK, uh, but what's happened elsewhere? Yes, morning. I mean, a little bit sort of sim similar, if you like, because those big centre parties, the uh, Conservative centre-right parties in Europe and the sort of centre-left socialists, suffered badly across Europe, really, too, uh, as much as the UK. So uh, in Germany, in France, uh, but saw their vote share drop quite sharply. Uh, that then uh, was replaced, as you were just saying, by good performances for the Greens, who had a very good night in Germany, a very, very strong result. Uh, in Ireland, in France, uh, the Greens returning MEPs from all of those places. So they will see their block in the Parliament go up. The Liberals, uh, an important one to mention there, because they uh, are jumping up to probably around 100 MEPs in this 750-seat chamber, uh, largely on the back as well of Emmanuel Macron's performance in France. There, he came in just behind uh, Marine Le Pen uh, and her former National Front, far right. Uh, she topped the poll. Actually, I think a seat, she'll be one seat down on her performance of five years ago. So good result, but slightly mixed result for her. And the far right sort of wave that many had been predicting or expecting, well, a strong performance in France, yes, a very strong performance in Italy from the governing League party there, but they have saw their other partners uh, in smaller countries around Europe doing quite badly. So in the Netherlands, in Denmark, uh, slumping uh, in those places. So across the board, what we see more fragmenting, big parties in the middle slipping, but those green and liberal parties doing well, and they may well hold the balance of power here going forward. And Damien, just a thought for us, I mean, it could well be academic as to who has been voted in from the UK. All these Brexit MEPs, the new Brexit MEPs, may be academic altogether, but still a possibility they'll be sitting in their seats in that chamber. Yes, they will be, uh, because they, the, this chamber, the new MEPs, will be back at the beginning of July. The UK at the minute uh, is due to leave uh, the EU by the end of October, so it may be a few weeks. It will be in that early sort of period when uh, jobs will be being carved up, uh, committee ships and all that sort of thing. So they will be around for that period. Interestingly, their presence is already having an impact in a way because the loss of those Conservative uh, and Labour MEPs is partly what's denting 
the share of the big centre-right, centre-left blocks here, so uh, is taking away from them. Uh, and that is going to have an impact in feeding through uh, in a loss of those uh, two blocks' authority as it comes to deciding the top jobs, the top job, the President of the European Commission uh, and the President of the European Council. Donald Tusk's replacement, Jean-Claude Juncker's replacement, the bargaining over those will begin today and tomorrow EU leaders will be here uh, trying to talk through what they think the options are for those new jobs for the next five years. And that is important because those two people will be a part of what guides the EU forwards and possibly through the completion of the Brexit process and beyond uh, in the next few years. Dame, for the moment, thank you very much uh, for that look there. And worth saying, we will, of course, be speaking to all parties across the morning this morning, uh, very much dominated by those uh, uh, elections for MEPs, could be all the results. And we will be speaking to Nigel Farage, of course, a huge win for the Brexit party overnight. We'll be speaking to him a little later on in the programme. It's 11 minutes uh, past It's just coming to 20 minutes past six. Our programme this morning very much dominated by those results. All came in in the early hours of this morning. We're going to bring you right up to date with the big picture. So Britain's two main political parties have suffered big losses as the Brexit Party scored a sweeping victory in the European Parliament elections. Now, the party, which was only launched six weeks ago, secured 30% of the vote. We can talk to our polling expert, Sir John Curtis, about how these results are going to shape British politics. I mean, that's a leap in itself, isn't it, John? I know you've been up all night following this really closely. Um, there's something I want to clear up, actually. Um, looking at a lot of the, the reports about how people have voted, of those who did vote, which way is it tilting? Is it tilting towards Remain or tilting towards breakfast, Brexit? Because at the moment, we're reporting, the BBC is reporting, it's 40.4 of the vote went to Remain um, and, and less to Brexit. Yeah, well, that's a fair summary of the shares of the vote going for parties that were avowedly pro uh, either um, uh, having a second referendum or avowedly saying that they were willing to accept leaving without a deal. Uh, we could, though, quibble about the inclusion of the nationalist parties, particularly in Scotland, where we know from polling evidence that actually, despite the party's position, it also gathers in the support of around 25 per cent of Leave voters north of the border. So if you actually want to just compare uh, those parties whose stance is either accepting a, a second uh, referendum or, one, or accepting the idea of leaving without a deal, then actually ends up with 35 each. And I think, to be honest, the crucial thing to understand about, about this election is that what we've really discovered or really had affirmed is that this country is, for the most part, still relatively evenly divided on the issue of Brexit. But above all, and what it's really confirmed, is that we're deeply polarised on it. Because given the choice between voting for parties that, like the Conservative Party, says, well, we're trying to have a deal, but we haven't quite got there yet, and Nigel Farage's appeal of, look, let's just leave, and if necessary, leave without a deal. And on the Remain side, Labour's position of, well, look, we ought to try to bring the 52 and the 48 per cent together, and we should respect the result, though, of course, if we don't like the deal, we'll have a second referendum. And parties saying, let's just have a second referendum, the latter one. And this is, in, in consist is this consistent with what we've seen in the polling for quite some time, which is that the two most popular choices in this country about Brexit are indeed leaving without a deal or having a second referendum in the hope and expectation that we will get a different result and that therefore uh, resolving the Brexit impasse is not going to be easy uh, because we are A, divided and B, polarised and that therefore, you know, coming up with an answer to Brexit that's going to unite a majority of the country and bring the 52 and the 48 per cent together, frankly, looks an even more difficult prospect this morning uh, than it did uh, 24 hours ago. John, I began this interview by saying we'll look at how this shapes UK pol politics. I, I think it's fair to say that the results aren't a huge surprise, but what will be significant now is how the leaders of well, Conservatives the, and Labour now well, react, being well, clear about Brexit. Sure. One of, the, one of the results certainly isn't a surprise. The idea that the Conservative Party was going to get trashed by uh, the Brexit Party was well and truly given, uh, given in the polls. And, you know, probably, Nagam, at least part of the timing of the Prime Minister's resignation on Friday was in anticipation of how terrible the results are going to be. And there is no doubt that the Conservative Party now is going 
and have a debate about how do we deliver Brexit? How do we deliver Brexit by the end of October? Um, and do we therefore embrace the possibility of leaving without a deal? Because I think the message to the Conservative Party is it's going to be difficult for it to recover unless it delivers Brexit. But equally, on the other side, Given the extent to which, the, uh, which is where the surprise was, we knew the Labour Party, Liberal Democrats were creeping up on the Labour Party, but not overtaking them by six points. And it now is very clear that the Liberal Democrats are now the single most popular amongst Remain voters. They've taken that crown away from the Labour Party, and that is bound, and we've already heard Labour spokesmen making it clear that they're now rethinking what their position should be, and probably the Labour Party is going to move more firmly in favour of a second referendum. The effect of which therefore means is that the House of Commons itself is also going to be more polarised. Conservative and Labour, I think, are going to move apart from each other, and that those who uh, are uh, opposed to Brexit are now more and more firmly saying, you know what, we actually need to fall in behind the idea of a second referendum in order to avoid the risk of leaving without a deal. So look forward to more fractious, more divided politics because they, the attempts, I think, of the Conservative Labour parties to bridge the Conservative, the Remain Leave divide, I think those efforts are now going to have less emphasis John. than simply trying to win the vo retain the votes of the voters that both these parties have lost tonight. John, always good to hear your thoughts. We'll be speaking um, a little later as well in a couple of hours. Thanks very much. You're welcome. So the outcome of the European elections has reaffirmed, you're hearing it then, the deep divide between supporters and opponents of the country's planned exit from the European Union. Has the Brexit debate re-engaged voters? Well, Vicky Holland has been at a count in Manchester to find out. Manchester on a bank holiday, the sunshine giving the city a continental feel. But Europe and the European elections wasn't everybody's focus. To be honest, I don't know what the election is for. Is it for Brexit? <laughs> Really? No, is it? If... It's to elect our MEPs. No, I'm not, I don't really mind about the result. I care about Brexit, but not like, who's in Parliament. I, I didn't vote on Thursday. Uh, the reason why, because we're leaving, uh, you know, Europe and Brexit, I, was, I didn't see the point. Last time it kind of passed me by a bit, really. So um, I felt like I had to do my duty and, and make sure I voted and got my point across. In Manchester's former Central Railway station, the count got underway. The North West was previously split into loyal Labour heartlands, rural Conservative voters and strong support for UKIP. No more. I therefore declare that the following candidates have been duly elected to the North West electoral region. Claire Regina Fox, the Brexit Party. This time, it was the Brexit party who took the most seats, with UKIP nowhere to be seen. None of us were aware that we were standing four weeks ago, so it has been incredible. And, and I really do think it's, it's partly because the organisation of the Brexit party, but it actually also is because people are really angry. The Conservatives ended up with no MEPs at all. For those working at grassroots level, it's a hard result to swallow. We've got a lot of flack on the doorstep with regards to what's going on in Westminster. And a lot of people saying that why should they vote? Because it's not democracy anymore, is it? So a lot of people feel very disenfranchised with politics at the moment. And even in the Labour heartlands of Manchester, the candidates were punished. A disappointment that we haven't got three. We've got to re-engage with people that voted remain. We've got to re-engage with people that voted leave. But for the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, it was a night to celebrate. I have been a Trafford councillor for 19 years. I've been active in the Liberal Democrats for most of my life. It's an amazing time. It's an absolute honour to be elected to represent the region and I am, yeah, I'm just so, so pleased that the voters in the North West have put their faith in the Green Party. Here in the North West, like much of the country, it is the traditional parties who have suffered, Labour and the Conservatives. The Conservatives completely wiped out here. It is the Brexit Party who have taken three of the seats, but the Liberal Democrats have also done better than ever before, winning two seats in the North West. And with some parties suggesting a general election is the only way to solve the problem of Brexit, the two big parties will have to work hard to clean up. Victoria Holland, BBC News, Manchester. So we're going to keep you up to date throughout the morning, talking to um, all the political parties, including Nigel Farage, who's won, his party has won 28 seats in the European elections. 28 minutes past six, get the news travelling where the way you are.
Good morning, you are watching Breakfast with Charlie State and Naga Manchetti. Time is 6.31. Let's bring you right up to date with those uh, European election votes. Nigel Farage's new Brexit party has dealt a huge blow to the Conservatives and Labour in the European parliamentary elections. His party's won 28 seats out of the 64 which have been declared so far. That's almost a third of the vote across Britain. Anne Widdicombe is one of his new MEPs. The night reaffirms the vote of 2016. Yeah, yeah. Because there was only one reason for voting for the Brexit party, and that was if you wanted a Brexit. No. But I just thank all the voters who voted for us, who said to the politicians at Westminster, yeah. we meant what we said. Yeah. It was also a good night for the Liberal Democrats. The pro-Remain party won in London, came second overall, gaining 15 seats in the European Parliament. Now, the outcome of the vote was polarised between those in favour and against the planned exit from the European Union. We get the latest from Wales, uh, from our political correspondent there in just a moment. First, though, let's go to Northern Ireland. And our correspondent, uh, Chris Page, is there for us this morning. Morning to you, Chris. Tell us a picture from where you are. Well, Charlie, if you're hankering after a second wave of counting, of tallies, of declarations after last night, well, this is the place to be today. Northern Ireland hasn't quite started counting uh, its votes yet. That process will get underway in about an hour and a half's time. Three uh, MEPs to be elected here. Turnout, we know, is stronger than in the rest of the country at 45%. That's perhaps reflecting the fact that Northern Ireland, in many ways, has been uh, on the front line of Brexit because, of course, it's the only part of the UK to have a land border uh, with another EU state and that border has been part of so much of the debate throughout the whole process. So three seats up for grabs, one held by Sinn Féin who are uh, very anti-Brexit, one held by the Democratic Unionist Party, very pro-Brexit, the third by the Ulster Unionist Party who campaigned to remain uh, in the 2016 referendum but now say that the result of that referendum should be honoured and the UK should leave the EU. Now the DUP and Sinn Féin pretty much guaranteed to hold on to their seats, that third seat much more unpredictable, the Ulster Unionist Party coming under pressure from the Nationalist SDLP and the Cross Community Alliance Party, both of whom very much in favour of remaining in the EU, and the traditional unionist voice who are passionate Brexiteers. So people will be watching to see what the breakdown in the returns are for pro-Remain parties and Leave parties, and also whether unionists hold on to their two-to-one majority in European Parliament seats here. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, let's talk to Arwen Jones, who's in Wales for us. Uh, Arwen, good to see you. Um, quite devastating for the Labour Party. Plaid Cymru doing um, better. Yes, I mean, there is an extent to which, of course, the results here in Wales mirrored what happened at a UK-wide level. The Brexit Party topping the polls here, gaining two out of Wales' four MEPs and getting around a third of the vote. But as you're saying, it's the placings of the other party which has been so interesting here. And the context, of course, is Labour's vice-like grip on Welsh politics for the last century or more, winning 38 of the last 39 Wales-wide votes, but coming third last night behind Plaid Cymru, the first time in the Nationalists' uh, 90 year history that they've done better than Labour in a Wales wide election. That's why Adam Price, Plaid's leader, saying that the tectonic plates had shifted here in Wales in that regard. But of course, these were European elections to an extent, they were Brexit uh, elections. And it's interesting seeing the different take that different parties uh, are having on the result. For example, Nathan Gill, one of the Brexit Party's MEPs here, saying, well, the results are very clear, showing that Brexit is still, uh, Wales is still a Brexit country. People had voted voted for the Brexit they wanted in 2016. But run the numbers, and it's a slightly more nuanced picture, because if you add up all the pro-Brexit party results, so the Conservatives, UKIP and Brexit party, you get around 353,000 votes. Add up all the unambiguously Remain parties, so you're looking at Plaid Cymru, the Greens, the Liberal Democrats, Change UK, you get 354,000 votes. It then comes down to what you do with the 150 or so thousand Labour votes in Wales, and perhaps Perhaps it's that uh, ambiguity, uh, ambiguousness from the Labour Party which was, uh, meant it had such a disappointing evening last night. That split, isn't it? That tight split is something we're definitely going to be talking about. Aaron Jones in Cardiff, thanks very much. So we're talking to all the uh, main parties today. Brexit Party, of course, wasn't the only winner. The Greens finished above the Conservatives for the first time in a national election. The party's deputy leader, Amelia Womack, joins us now from Westminster. Very good morning to you. Thank you for your time good this morning. morning. Uh, can you give us a, your, your first sort of your overview of your, what the Greens managed to achieve? 
So at the start of this, we had three MEPs and now we have seven. We've built on our track record of delivering in the European Parliament, whether that's uh, tackling tax evasion, tax dodging, climate change, air pollution, environmental destruction, austerity. And then we're proving our ability in regions where we simply haven't won before. And I think that's as a result of our strength in the council elections and meet, uh, so many people realising the power of voting green and the power of, of green representation when you get green representation or people wanted someone who had a clear voice on Brexit and there was you absolutely and there was the Liberal Democrats and maybe they were in in the uh, voting booth going do you know what this time I'll go green it may be that some of the issues you were talking about didn't loom large in that decision well, I think we had such a strong portfolio of policies and I think the fact that we were talking about Brexit and we were talking about climate change and as well as these other issues that we've been proving ourselves time and time again, not just here in the UK but across the whole of Europe as well. And I think it is, what's clear to me is that people want action and not words. And that's on issues such as climate change where we've been told we've got just 11 years to take positive action. And you can see that the European elections where we can work internationally on our shared problems are the best place to get a clear voice where that kind of change can happen. But those other issues, we were talking about them time and time again. And I think it is powerful to be making sure that, that uh, the work that Molly Scott Cato has done in the South West, um, the work that our London MEPs have been doing for 20 years, we have proven the power of Green. We have proven what Green MEPs can do. And I think it is that track record as well that has meant that so many people have seen the Green Party as their home in these elections. Uh, there has been one major winner in this uh, election, and that, that is the Brexit Party and Nigel Farage. Uh, what do you make of their success? I fundamentally think that the way that that vote is split and when you add up the, the number of very clearly Remain votes of, of where we stand on that, that we need to be bringing this back to the people with a people's vote because we need to be making sure that now we've got a deal on the table that people have a final say. But what I also hope is that with so much um, division in our country that as all of the parties need to be rallying together to make sure that we have a very strong, clear voice against all hate that has emerged during these elections. The uncomfortable uh, truth, of course, is that notwithstanding the success that you've had in these elections, and this applies to you, of course, and to the Brexit Party, you are not represented in, in uh, Parliament. I mean, Brexit Party not at all, you very little. And that is where the decision over what happens next and all the other issues that you're interested in will be made. But we, we've got a formidable force in Parliament. I mean, I feel that Caroline Lucas does the work of, of more than one MP. But I think fundamentally, the fact that we are building on the... We've got more councillors than we've ever had before. We've got more um, people in more places working on this issue. And the fact that we are a united voice when it comes to the EU and our future in Europe and a Remain party, that it's not just the Parliament is currently in gridlock. And that's why it's the people's vote and bringing this back to the people that is so powerful and when that happens because I feel like it's the only way out of this mess then our party will be ready to campaign. Can I just ask one, one last thing uh, if I may if there were to be a general election are you confident that your vote that has been seen in this election would be replicated? I mean, we saw us topping uh, the the poll. We, you saw us topping vote shares in places across the country, in Bristol, in Brighton and Hove, in Norwich. The possibilities here are very clear, and I think that uh, that if a general election happens, then it will be uh, we will be st campaigning strongly in a number of areas. But I think that what's but, but for me, the fact that the two-party system is clearly broken. We saw that in the council elections. We're seeing that in the European elections. I think this is a real opportunity. To to make sure that we're talking about ish, things like proportional representation because even the Conservatives seem like they, they, they will need a little, the, the, if we're going to get that representation, even the Conservatives feel like they should be talking about proportional representation at the moment. But I think that there is an opportunity for us in the general election. But for me, a people's vote must come first because if we have a general election, it will only be a few marginal seats that will make those decisions. If we had a, a people's vote, then it'll be one person, one vote. And that's the only way that you can have a clear outcome on, on Brexit and what the people truly want. Amelia Womack, thank you very much for your time this morning. Amelia Womack is Deputy Leader of the Green Party.
It's 19 minutes. Now 6.48, slightly different feel to breakfast this morning. Effectively, it's an election programme. Following the uh, results yesterday, it might be a bank holiday. But we are bringing you what happened in the elections. We're going to concentrate on Scotland now. The SNP is on track for its best ever European election results. Uh, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, says this is a strong message that the country has rejected Brexit. We can talk to the SNP's leader at Westminster, Ian Blackford. Good morning. Um, good morning for the SNP. Yes, good morning, Aga. It's a fantastic morning for the SNP. You know, we've been in government now in Scotland for 12 years and we've delivered our best ever result in a European election. 38% of the vote, the best result, I must say, of any party in the whole of the United Kingdom. So we're delighted with the support that the people of Scotland have shown us in these, these elections. So how many MEPs will you have? Well, there are six MEPs covering the whole of Scotland and we'll have three of those. We've gone up from two, so a result we're very, very pleased about. And we stood on that, a mandate of asking the people of Scotland to reject Brexit, that we don't want to be taken out of the European Union against our will. So a very clear message from ourselves and, and indeed the other uh, Remain parties in Scotland as well. So we've really rejected Brexit and in particular we've rejected a, a no-deal Brexit. Uh, in looking at this realistically, how much of the SNP vote is a protest vote in terms of people being frustrated with the government, with the Conservative Party and the Labour Party? Well, of course, Naga, we are the government in Scotland. We've been in power in Scotland since 2007. We've won every one of the last few elections. I don't think anyone can look okay, at it. Okay, I'll rephrase the it then. The ones who have been in charge of Brexit. Well, look, I, th I think, what, what, if I can do it this way, I would contrast a government in Edinburgh, which is getting on with the day job under my friend and colleague Nicola Sturgeon, and the chaos that we see in Westminster. This is now really a zombie parliament, and we can look upon the fact that we're going to be discussing who's going to be the Prime Minister over the course of the next couple of months. Nothing is happening in this place, and I think there is a real frustration in Scotland. And we are making it very clear to the Conservatives that we are not going to be dragged out of the European Union against our will. We were told in our independence referendum in 2014 if we stayed in the United Kingdom then our rights as EU citizens would be respected. That's been ignored. And if I may say so, when I look at the poor performance of the Labour and the Conservative parties, and particularly the Tories, because Ruth Davidson said that a vote for the Tories would be a vote against the second independence referendum. Well, that hasn't worked very well for the Tories in particular. And I would say that if we do end up in a situation that we are going to get dragged out of Europe, that Westminster has to recognise that the Scottish National Party has a mandate for an independence referendum and we need to be able to secure our own future what is more as important? a European nation. So what is more important to the SNP then? Um, a second referendum or stopping Brexit? Well, of course, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that the SNP is a party of independence, but we will work collectively with others to try and stop Brexit because we believe that fundamentally what Brexit is going to do is enormous harm to our communities. It's going to cost jobs up and down the United Kingdom. And, of course, we will work with others to stop Brexit. We want to see a people's vote. But what I am concerned about, Naga, is that when, when I look at what's happening within the Conservative Party, they're trying to out-Brexit each other. When we look at whether you look at Boris or whether you look at the other contenders, they're now seems to be a growing consensus in the Conservative Party that they're talking about no deal. And fundamentally, we have to stop that risk of crashing out, that enormous impact of economic self-harm that would happen with a no deal Brexit. And of course, we've got the option to revoke Article 50. And I should remind everyone that's watching your programme this morning that Scottish politicians did go to the European Court of Justice. We won that determination that we know that Parliament can revoke Article 50. So we will do everything in our power, working with others to stop Brexit. And I suppose, in a sense, we have got that insurance policy that if the United Kingdom is going to crash out of the European Union, that we can go to the people of Scotland, we can have an independence referendum, and we can secure our future as a European nation. That's but the only way you're going to get a second referendum, isn't it? Uh, well, independence will happen anyway, and I think Westminster's got to respect the fact that the SNP won that election. What do you mean it will happen anyway? What do you mean it will happen anyway? I, I, I think, look, we're now 20 years into devolution. It's 20 years since the Scottish Parliament was established, and we will be saying to the people of Scotland, let's complete that journey. Let's make sure that we have the powers of a normal, independent nation, but one that sees itself at the heart of Europe. One of the reasons that we need to do that, of course, is because we need to deliver sustainable economic growth. There's a real threat to us if we don't have freedom of movement, that we don't have that labour pool, which is going to be so essential to growing the Scottish economy. Um, so ir irrespective of Brexit, Scotland will become an independent country. Ian Blackford uh, talking to us from Westminster, SNP leader in Westminster. Thank you. Thank you. It is, of course, a bank holiday Monday, so we should go to car boot sale in Sutton Coldfield, and Tim's doing exactly that for us this morning. Morning to you, Tim. 
Yeah, good morning to you. A bit of bargain hunting, a bit of decluttering going on here at Lee Marston Car Boot Sale, just outside Sutton Coalfield, about 10 miles to the east of Birmingham. And yeah, Bank Holiday Monday, and as you can see, the stalls are out. We thought we'd get a bit of a reaction to the European elections. It was a good result for the Brexit Party in the West Midlands constituency. They picked up three MEPs, one for Labour, one for Lib Dem, one for the Greens and one Conservatives. But those uh, big games for the Brexit Party reflected here. Look at this sign here. Happiness is not a destination. It is a way of life. I don't know, maybe Nigel Farage is thinking along those lines this morning. Gary, what did you make of the results? I think the results show that we... Uh, it shows we need some change, but is that the right change? You know, we need to bring back some uh, political respect uh, to the country. And do we need a general election? I don't know for a new Prime Minister. I think it's something that we need to think about. Interesting stuff, Gary. Good luck with your sales. Thank you very much. Take, take care. I'm going to have a quick, quick chat now to, to Brian and Sue. Now, they've been car booting for many, many a year. Brian, what did you make of the, the results of the European election? I thought it was entirely predictable because I think the whole exercise was um, basically a protest vote on all sides, both from Remainers and Leavers. Um, Nigel Farage, I think, uh, was predicted to get, what, 34% of the vote? And I think that's pretty well what he got. What about you, Sue? I didn't vote. I've lost the will. I, I think I think a lot of the country are absolutely fed up. I didn't know who to vote for, so I didn't vote. And I think as a female, that's really sad because people people fought a long time ago to get the vote for me, and it's the first time ever since I was 18 I haven't voted because I didn't know who to vote for. Interesting stuff. There also increased turnout in some areas. But Brian, Sue, thank you very much indeed, and good luck with your sales today. Thank now, you. in this part of the world, in the uh, referendum in 2016, around about 59% of people voted for leave. And there's one gentleman over here, John, who I know is very uh, pleased with the good results of the Brexit Party. John, weren't you? What did you make of what happened in the European elections? I'm not sure about the European elections, but the British one. That's, I'm glad about that. Like, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, the British one, because uh, that's why Labour and Conservative have been demolished in these elections, because the people voted for it three years ago. So why aren't the p politicians listening in Westminster? And that's why they got a drop in. And that's what's going to happen. Even though uh, May's resigned, what's going to... It's still going to ha Conservatives are still in the same mess. They're not listening to what the people are saying. Interesting stuff. Buying those shoes? I'm looking to buy the... Looking, yeah. <laughs> They're just your style. <laughs> Maybe a bit small. I don't know. <laughs> okay. John, thanks so much indeed. Well, we'll be talking to more of the, uh, the car booters here, getting some more reaction to these quite extraordinary results for some of the political parties uh, later on this morning. But for now, we'll leave you with the, the news, the weather and the travel wherever you are this morning. Good morning. You're watching Breakfast on BBC News with Charlie State and Naga Monchetti. Uh, this morning on our programme, effectively an election special. We'll be looking at all the results of the results for the European elections. And of course, it was a big win for Nigel Farage's Brexit party. If we don't leave on October the 31st, then the scores you've seen for the Brexit party today will be repeated in a general election and we are getting ready for it. The Conservatives suffer the worst performance since 1832, pushed into fifth place, while Labour is punished for a lack of clarity over Brexit. The Comeback Kids, a surge of support for the Liberal Democrats, which claim second spot, and a victorious night for the Greens, making significant gains. And we're in Sutton Coalfield all morning, finding out what the buyers and sellers make of the European election results. Of course, comprehensive coverage of uh, the results throughout the morning here. We'll be hearing from all the key players from the main parties. Morning in sport, Lewis Hamilton describes his victory in Monaco as the hardest one yet, as he dedicates his fourth win this season to triple world champion Nicky Lauda, who died on Monday. Good morning. Today we're looking at a day of bright spells, some sunny spells and also some showers, some of which will be heavy and thundery and feeling cooler than yesterday. I'll have more in 15 minutes.
Good morning. It's Monday, the 27th of May. Our top story this morning. Labour and the Conservatives have paid the price for their indecision over Brexit, suffering huge losses in the European election. The newly formed Brexit party took a 32% share of the vote. The pro-EU Liberal Democrats finished above the Conservative party for the first time ever. Let's take a look through some of the detail of those results then. So, Nigel Farage's Brexit party formed, you remember, just six weeks ago was the runaway winner gaining 28 seats in all. At the opposite end of the Brexit divide, also a good day for the Liberal Democrats, which now has 15 MEPs. If we look at each party's share of the votes, it makes clear just how bad a night it was for the Conservatives, receiving less than 10%. Now, that's the worst performance in an election since 1832. Looking at the change in numbers from the last EU election, you can see just where some of those Brexit party seats came from, taking over nearly all of the UKIP vote, as well as undoubtedly some of that 15% that was lost by the Conservatives. Let's get a better idea of the Brexit party's share of the vote, uh, how it looks across the UK. So we have uh, huge swathes of teal, that's the colour we've chosen across England and Wales, but it's Scotland. Uh, the SNP looks set to take over from Labour as the dominant party there. No results from Northern Ireland yet. Councils there will begin counting votes at 8 o'clock this morning. Now, if you do want to follow those results, there will be full coverage, of course, on the BBC News Channel. So with a round of what's happened, here's our political correspondent, Nick Erdley. A vote that wasn't supposed to take place to a parliament we're supposed to have left, a result that shows the country is still bitterly divided. The big winners, two parties with very different but very clear messages on Brexit. Brexit, Brexit now! Nigel Farage's Brexit party topped the poll with almost a third of the vote. The reason, of course, is very obvious. We voted to leave in a referendum. We were supposed to do so on March the 29th, and we haven't. The Liberal Democrats, with their anti-Brexit message, had a big night too, coming second across the UK. Every vote for the Liberal Democrats is a vote to stop Brexit. For the two parties that normally dominate British politics, it was a disaster. The Conservatives were thumped, finishing fifth with less than 10% of the vote. Three years ago, the country voted to leave. It's three years on and we haven't left. And inevitably, therefore, people were going to be drawn in a polarised way to the kind of single-issue pro- or anti-Brexit parties. Labour too were punished, finishing third with less than 15%. That'll spark a heated debate about whether it should now get fully behind another referendum. We're now going to find ourselves in a position where we will have a Tory leadership who will insist on either a bad deal or no deal at all. And I fear it will be no deal. And in those circumstances, we must be equally clear. And it will be a disaster for our country to have no deal. There should be a referendum and we should campaign to remain. Yeah. The Green vote was up too. They beat the Conservatives into fourth place. UKIP were wiped out and Change UK failed to make their mark. In Scotland, the SNP were miles ahead on almost 40%. The party will take three of the six seats there. In Wales, the Brexit party topped the poll. Plaid Cymru came second. Labour, a party who have dominated Welsh politics for a century, finished third. Northern Ireland counts today. It was a good night for parties who have taken a firm stand on Brexit, but voters are still split between parties who back leaving the EU as soon as possible and those who want another referendum and ultimately to stay. If you were hoping this would end the Brexit debate, you may well be disappointed. McGarry, BBC News. Let's talk to our political correspondent, Tom Barton, who's in Westminster for us. So, Tom, I suppose, you know, even if a lot of the result isn't a huge surprise, what people will be thinking about now is how this sets us up for the political landscape in the UK going forward. 
Yeah, that's right. It's no doubt this was a terrible result for the two main parties, winning fewer than uh, half the votes that they won in 2014. What voters do want, though, well, that is far from clear. Yes, there was a victory for the Brexit party on their No Deal platform, winning more than a third of the vote. But parties that stood on a clear Remain platform, the Lib Dems, the Greens, Change UK, the Scottish and Welsh Nationalists, well, between them, they won more votes. What then does all of that mean for politics here in Westminster and the two main parties? Well, they have each in their own way been trying to walk a line of compromise on Brexit and that well clearly hasn't gone down well with voters and so for the Conservatives in the midst of a leadership election there is going to be pressure on candidates to toughen up their stances on Brexit. For Labour well pressure is going to grow on the leadership there to uh, line up behind another referendum. For both parties though those changes would risk alienating parts of their election uh, of their electorate. There really is no Nothing about these results which provides an easy way out for either of the two main parties. Thanks very much, Tom Barton there. Now, early indications from the European parliamentary elections suggest a fall in support for established centrist parties, like you were hearing. Yes, there have been gains for those on the left and right, as well as the Greens. And voter turnout was sharply up on the last elections. Uh, let's go to Brussels now and talk to our Europe correspondent, Damien Grammaticus. Uh, Damien, morning to you. We've concentrated so far on the programme. On uh, those uh, results here in the UK, tell us more about the bigger picture. Yes, and you're right, that turnout figure is really interesting, I think, uh, being made quite a lot of here. But just over 50%, we think, turnout. So a big jump, a rise in turnout across Europe. So of the 400 million voters, 200 million, it seems, did cast their votes. Here, that's being seen as a sign of people re-engaging with European European issues and the whole debate around sort of issues Brexit, uh, nationalists, immigration, climate, all those things sort of energising voters. How did that play out? Well, as you were saying, the big parties, the centre-right, conservative allied parties, the centre-left, socialist slipping, particularly in Germany and France, the real winners, though, from that seem to have been the Greens and the Liberals. The Greens doing really well in Germany, coming second in France, doubling their vote uh, in Finland, in Denmark, in Ireland. The far right performed very well in Italy, but not as well as expected elsewhere. Yes, they sort of met expectations in France, but the far right surge didn't really materialise. So it's those groups, the Greens and the Liberals, together with the traditional centre parties who sort of hold the sort of dominant centre ground here. Damien, thank you very much for that. We're talking to you throughout the morning, of course. Later I'm in the program. right now. Sorry. Yeah, later in the programme, we're going to talk to the Brexit Party leader, the winner of this um, EU election so far from the UK point of view, Nigel Farage, at about half seven. A lot of our programme this morning dominated by those results, but we will bring you, of course, the rest of the news uh, well, now. Past seven is the time. So let's go back to our main story, the results uh, from the European elections. Uh, let's concentrate for a moment on the Liberal Democrats. They were declared uh, back in business this morning after enjoying their best ever result in the EU elections with a second place finish. The party says its success is due to it being the strongest voice of Remain. Let's talk now to Baroness Sal Brinton, who is president of the UK Liberal Democrats. So a good morning for the Liberal Democrats then. In, indeed. Um, when I became president four and a half years ago, People had written us off and said we couldn't recover. And I am so proud of our members, 100,000 members across the country who have worked hard, built up, helped us with a strong message. Hundreds of thousands of people who joined our Stop Brexit campaign, which resulted on Thursday in millions of people voting for us as the strongest Remain party. We've got our best ever European election results and it's really, really encouraging for the future. Well, you say it's encouraging. How does this translate? in the future in the UK political landscape? We came top of the poll in a number of seats that we either want to take back or to gain at the next general election. Oxford, Cambridge, St Albans, places like that, and some quite unexpected places as well. And I think that also demonstrates the strength that we have in local areas where we've been building up over the last four and a half, five years. Do you think you should have um, pushed harder to have um, a bit uh, a bit more cooperation with Change UK? 
Um, it just wasn't possible. Change UK had registered very late and under the, the European election system uh, the arrangements are very much more complex than they are for any other type of election. Uh, but we were also very clear that with our own revival we wanted to give people the opportunity to vote for Liberal Democrats, which they have absolutely done, over 20% of the vote in the elections that were counted last night. What's realistic? You were practically obliterated in the last elections. What's realistic in the next general election for the Liberal Democrats? Well, too early to say, but on these figures, what's, I what's think the, we would see a goal, substantial then? number. I, I mean, I'm not in the projection game at this same No, but you have ambitions. Sleep, You're aware of the I have to party's tell ambitions. You well, no, we are we are ambitious to certainly gain go back to the time when we had 50, 60, 70. Will it happen next time? Who knows? What I do think is that, that I know that this is the first time in 100 years that we've beaten both the Conservative and the Labour Party in the same election. And we are clearly able to demonstrate that both the Conservative and Labour Party did badly because they were absolutely split, couldn't articulate what they wanted on Brexit. We've been very clear we are the strongest Remain party. We had a strong message led what? by Vince Cable, who was very clear about that as well. And I think that's what's paid dividends for us. Your outgoing leader, Vince Cable. Um, what, mm. How does this play out when it comes to actually having a voice at the table in, when it comes to negotiating Brexit for the Lib Dems? Well, we will remain um, talking to senior politicians, both from within government but other parties, as we already but do in Parliament. Rather hope that whoever the new Prime Minister is engages with all the parties in Parliament, because that's also where there's a blockage at the moment. We have a, a Cabinet and a government who are totally, totally split. That's been clear for ages. Parliament is too. But for us as a party, because of that, we believe there has to be a people's vote. People have made it so clear, regardless of where they stand, whether it's remain or leave, they actually want another say because so many things have become clarified and understood since that referendum. But looking three at the front ago. runners, looking at the front runners, or you know those who have put themselves up for um, the leadership for the Conservative Party, there doesn't seem anyone who is of, going to be of influence who wants a people's vote or who isn't ruling out no deal, leaving the EU without a deal. Well, that, that's very interesting because that's not the nature of the Conservative Parliamentary Party, which just demonstrates how split they are and, you know, have to leave them to their own systems to try and work out what's happening there. But this country is absolutely split on this. We gained all the clear Remain parties, 40% of the vote on Thursday night, more than the Brexit Party and the UKIP Party combined. And we're very, very clear, therefore, that the people's vote is the right thing uh, to move to and the Liberal Democrats would campaign to stay in the EU because we see the UK as being much stronger in economic terms, for climate change and for security if we are part of the EU. Baroness Sal Brinton, uh, President of the Liberal Democrats, thank you very much for your time with us this morning. Time now is 17 minutes past seven. It is a politics-heavy programme this morning. There's, there's no escaping that. But you know what we need to do now? Well, we need to join the Carol Kirkwood party for a moment. <laughs> it's always a good Thank party. You, Joe. So we're leaving the Carol party and we're going back to European elections. Um, what these elections have done, they've reaffirmed the deep divide between supporters and opponents of the country's planned departure from the European Union. So has the Brexit debate re-engaged voters? Vicky Holland has been at a count in Manchester to find out more. Manchester on a bank holiday. The sunshine giving the city a continental feel. But Europe and the European elections wasn't everybody's focus. To be honest, I don't know what the election is for. <laughs> is it for Brexit? Not really. No, is it? It's to elect our MEPs. No, I'm not, I don't really mind about the result. I care about Brexit, but not... Like, Who's in Parliament? I didn't vote on Thursday. Uh, the reason why, because we're leaving, uh, you know, Europe and Brexit, I didn't see the point. Last time it kind of passed me by a bit, really. So um, I felt like I had to do my duty and, and make sure I voted and got my point across. In Manchester's former Central Railway station, the count got underway. The North West was previously split into loyal Labour heartlands, rural Conservative voters and strong support for UKIP. No more. I therefore declare that the following candidates have been duly elected to the North West Electoral Region. Claire Regina Fox, the Brexit Party. This time it was the Brexit Party who took the most seats, with UKIP nowhere to be seen. None of us were aware that we were standing four weeks ago, so it has been incredible. And, and I really do think it's, it's partly because the organisation of the Brexit Party, but it actually also is because people are really angry. 
The Conservatives ended up with no MEPs at all. For those working at grassroots level, it's a hard result to swallow. We've got a lot of flack on the doorstep with regards to what's going on in Westminster and a lot of people saying that why should they vote because it's not democracy anymore, is it? So it's a lot of people feel very disenfranchised with politics at the moment. And even in the Labour heartlands of Manchester, the candidates were punished. A disappointment that we haven't got three. We've got to re-engage with people that voted Remain. We've got to re-engage with people that voted Leave. But for the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, it was a night to celebrate. I have been a Trafford councillor for 19 years. I've been active in the Liberal Democrats for most of my life. It's an amazing time. It's an absolute honour to be elected to represent the region and I am, yeah, I'm just so, so pleased that the voters in the North West have put their faith in the Green Party. Here in the North West, like much of the country, it is the traditional parties who have suffered. Labour and the Conservatives. The Conservatives completely wiped out here. It is the Brexit Party who have taken three of the seats, but the Liberal Democrats have also done better than ever before, winning two seats in the North West. And with some parties suggesting a general election is the only way to solve the problem of Brexit, the two big parties will have to work hard to clean up. Victoria Holland, BBC News, Manchester. So we're trying to get a sense this morning, of course it is a bank holiday, people busy doing the things they do on a bank holiday, a car boot sale might be one of those. Tim Muffet is at one this morning. Morning to you Tim. Morning. Yeah, good morning. Just outside Sutton Coldfield, about 10 miles to the northeast of Birmingham, and we're looking for some bargains here. A bit of decluttering going on, trying to find something for the office. We've got a nice uh, wire set and a couple of uh, nice butter dishes there. Uh, just found Amy as well. What do you think of the results of the European elections? I think it showed that the country is still very split. I think there's a very, very big difference between Brexit and the Liberal Democrats, and I think it's still a divided decision. Do you think that things are going to change? I don't think it will. I think it's just such polar opposites and I think the government are going to find it really difficult to find an even ground between the two. Okay, Amy, thanks ever so much indeed. Thank you. Just picked up a parasol. Yes. <laughs> A few nice little bits. Yes, optimistic <laughs> for the weather. Now, this is an interesting area because the West Midlands constituency, um, last European election in 2014, um, since then, of course, UKIP didn't fare well so well this time round, but picked up three Brexit MPs, MEPs. And, Paul, what did you make of that? Uh, I didn't sleep through the night, not because of the, uh, the voting coming through, but I, I checked on the, the phone this morning and I was astonished, and, uh, but pleasantly pleased because um, I was saying to one of your colleagues just that I've never ever voted whether it's local votes or national votes through my life but I did vote um, two three years ago for this referendum because I thought I wanted to uh, try and place a vote which could actually have some understanding of where I want to be from my own point. So I, all I want is to be part of Europe to have various forms of protection whatever that may be maybe borders, maybe uh, control as in people coming in and out. Uh, has that been borne out in the Euro election results uh, as far as you can tell? Truthfully, I don't follow it. So I can't answer that. What I am saying is that, um, talking to your colleague um, Bernie Farage, uh, he stood firm for me where the likes of people have come and gone, Cameron, who uh, just personally so disappointed with him, where obviously he called for it, and the day, the day after, which it probably wasn't, a few days later, he resigns. That doesn't show any backbone. That doesn't show no intent for the, uh, for the country. Farage, whether you do like him or you don't, he has stood firm, hasn't he? That's certainly a view shared by many people here. Yeah, Paul, great. thanks so much. Good great. luck with your Thank sales you. as well. Well, we're going to be talking to more car booters, as they're known, this morning. A lot of opinions here, very interesting, and a lot of reactions to what's been happening overnight. Anyway, we'll leave you now with the news, the weather and the travel where you're watching Breakfast This Morning. Good morning, you're watching Breakfast with Charlie State and Naga Manchetti. Time now is 7.30 exactly. Here's a summary of this morning's main news. Nigel Farage's new Brexit party has dealt a huge blow to the Conservatives and Labour in the European parliamentary elections. The party's won 28 seats out of the 64 which have been declared so far. It's almost a third of the vote across Britain. Anne Widdicombe is one of its new MEPs.
tonight reaffirms the vote of 2016. Yeah. Because there was only one reason for voting for the Brexit party, and that was if you wanted a Brexit. No. But I just thank all the voters who voted for us, who said to the politicians at Westminster, yeah. we meant what we said. Yeah. Conservatives and Labour suffered heavy losses. The Tories came fifth behind the Green Party, its worst election result since 1832. It was a good night for the Liberal Democrats. The pro-Remain party won in London and came second overall, gaining 15 seats in the European Parliament. Northern Ireland, Scotland still to finalise their results. Now, the Brexit party has been the major winner in the European Parliament elections, as we've been saying, securing around a third of the vote. As the results came in, its leader Nigel Farage said the party was ready for a general election. And we can speak to him now from our London newsroom. Very good morning to you. Thank you for your time this morning. I just wonder if you could first of all give us your summary of what your party achieved. Well, it was launched six weeks ago, and in that very short space of time, we've managed to top the polls and win a national election and win it comfortably. So, look, we're very, very pleased uh, that we were able to do this in such a short space of time. Uh, but I think this shows the real sense of frustration out there. You know, we didn't just vote in a referendum to leave the EU. We voted for political parties in the general election of 2017, both of whom said they'd deliver. They didn't. March the 29th was embedded in people's minds as the date we left the European Union, we didn't, and that's why the Brexit party's here. What happens next with your party? Well, we're going on to Peterborough, where there is a by-election taking place next week. Uh, we will spend also some time today and onwards getting ready to fight a full-scale general election, because who's to say that could happen even this year? What do you think the message uh, that this election sends uh, specifically to the Conservative Party? Uh, they broke their promises, uh, and parties that break promises do badly in elections. That's the lesson from last night. But it's also fair to say this applies to a lot of Labour voters too. Labour promised to honour the result of the referendum. They are now moving rapidly towards being a party that wants a second referendum. And if you look in South Wales particularly, parts of the north of England, you'll see that the Brexit party was actually picking up more support from the Labour party there than it was from the Conservatives. Uh, it, it is a, a straightforward fact that you have no representation in Parliament. Obviously, as you said yourself, you've only existed for six weeks. Yeah. So this win is an extraordinary turnaround. There's no escape from that and a great success for you and the party. But nonetheless, you have no representation in Parliament. That well, remains the case. So business will carry on almost regardless. Look, we are the biggest party in the European Parliament, coming from the whole of Europe, uh, and what we want to do is play an active role, take some responsibility. We have got a mandate now, and we want the government to include us in their negotiating team. We have got to get ready for leaving the European Union on October the 31st. There's an awful lot we can do. So you're suggesting that whoever it is, and of course we're in this extraordinary time when we don't know who the new Prime Minister will be, but whoever that is, yeah. you think one of the first things that man or woman should do is call Nigel Farage and say, join us as we talk to Europe. Is, is that what you're saying? We can't afford to wait two months. We've got five months left until the date we're now due to leave, the 31st of October, and it's going to take two months, basically, for the Conservatives to sort out their next leader. That work, so that we're ready to leave with a WTO clean break Brexit, that work needs to be done, and we are happy to help in any way we can get this country ready. Have you had any representation from the Conservative Party at all? Uh, no. Um, the Conservative Party are confused. The Conservative Party are split. Uh, they are divided. And I've no doubt, as this leadership battle goes on, uh, they will probably descend into the political equivalent of a civil war. The Brexit Party is absolutely clear in what it stands for, and we're going to push on from here. It's not for me, or I suppose even you, to say what are the Conservatives going to do about this result, but the obvious thing for them to do would be to embrace the territory that you have succeeded in and if you like to go further towards uh, that area which you know that that firm territory of we'll leave we said we're going to leave and we will leave whoever the new prime minister is i mean in a way your success might drive them to to that place well i think our success uh, certainly ensured that theresa may went as prime minister more quickly 
than perhaps she might have done. Uh, but is a party that is so fundamentally divided uh, between Leave and Remain as the Conservatives, is it capable of picking a leader with a very clear path? I'm not sure that it is. And I think one of the big messages coming out of last night is that this two-party system that has dominated politics for so long, those days may well now be coming to an end. You know, we want to change politics for good, and that means we're, we're, we're about more than just leaving the European Union. We think the two-party system needs breaking up. We need a completely fresh approach to politics in our country. What's your view in the, uh, what appears to be the rising Remain vote, which, as in the same way that your party has had success, uh, the Lib Dems, for example, have had spectacular successes too. Well, what do you make of that? Well, the Lib Dems have had success. I mean, nothing like the scale that we have, but they've had success. Look, there were three parties out there, you know, three parties with three big spending budgets, all campaigning to remain. Although the Greens themselves will tell you that actually their votes were coming on other issues too. There's no doubt, you know, that there are voters out there that want remain. But if you add it all up, what you see is this country is still 52-48 in favour of leaving the European Union. Solemn promises were made to the British people. They need to be kept. Otherwise, what is our democracy worth? Yes, and the, another way of an analysing some of these results, away from the statistics, and you can get bogged down in that, is that there is a polarisation happening, which is th those parties, the, the main parties, the Conservatives and Labour, who, who, who people have dismissed in this election to a large degree, they've found themselves in very difficult territory. So a party like yours, which has a clear message, a party like the Lib Dems, or the Greens for that matter, are no, much smaller, who have a very clear message. The polarisation in British politics, if anything, has come out of these results overnight, has, got, has strengthened, hasn't it, the polarisation? Well, if you, by polarisation you mean clarity of position, uh, then yes. I mean, look, the Liberal Democrats are the leading Remain party. They want to overturn the result of the referendum. That's their position. Our position in the Brexit party is we want a clean break Brexit so that we are a genuinely independent country. They're the two positions, and frankly, if you try and do a bit of both, if you try to give us Brexit in name only, then in the end, nobody will be satisfied. And really, that in the, uh, I suppose history will say that is Mrs May's legacy. She tried to please everybody, she pleased nobody. Brexit is a fork in the road. It, it, it's a big, massive constitutional decision. We've made that decision and we deserve to have it delivered. Six weeks for the Brexit party and this extraordinary success in this election. Um, if we leave uh, the EU, if that happens, as is scheduled at the moment, where then the Brexit party? Are, are you going to come and then go again? What, what's the future? Well, I tell you what, if we win, we win, and I should be very pleased, because one thing I know for certain is if we'd left the Labour and Conservative parties on their own, there was zero prospect of us getting a proper, clean Brexit. If we could make it happen, and make it happen quickly, I would be delighted. But I do, though, think British politics is now about more than just leaving the European so, Union. Sorry, can I just establish that? When yeah. you, I understand that you're saying that, that being out would be a result. Does that mean Nigel Farage says... Uh, if we get out, then me and my Brexit party, we've done our work and, well, and goodbye. As I say, there is much more change needed in British politics. The two-party system isn't fit for purpose. There are institutions like the House of Lords uh, that, frankly, have become an absolute parody of themselves. There's a lot of work to do beyond Brexit to modernise and change the shape of British politics. But our primary goal is to get this country to be independent and self-governing. If that doesn't happen, and if we don't leave on the 31st of October, then what you will see is the Brexit party stunning everybody at the next general election. Nigel Farage, thank you very much for your time this thank morning. Thank you. Let's see, time now is 7.49. We're concentrating on those European election results this morning, spending quite a bit of time, of course, looking about what's happened here. But now we'll cast our eyes across the rest of Europe. Uh, turnout in the elections has been around 50%. It's the highest in two decades. Um, smaller parties have gained at the expense of the centre right and the centre left. Let's go to Berlin, where Jenny Hill is this morning. Jenny, um, I'll tell you what's also interesting. The demographic. Who has been voting for what? I know the Green Party has done, and climate change has been a real issue in Germany. 
Yeah, you're quite right. Um, let me just outline the two big stories of the night from Germany. First of all, um, the support leeching away from what they call the Volkspartei and the two big people's parties here. Mrs. Merkel's Conservatives and her coalition partners, the Social Democrats. Um, Mrs. Merkel's Conservatives have made significant losses. They're still the top party, but they are starting to leech support. And the Social Democrats have had a disastrous time of it. They are really heading towards political decimation if they continue on this course. But you're quite right. Number two story is the success of the Green Party. They're now the second biggest party looking at the overnight results. And that's, I think, for two reasons. First of all, climate change topped the list of voter concerns in the, in the run-up to this election. Um, it's a really big issue here in Germany. And Mrs Merkel's government is really failing to get a proper environmental policy together. They just can't agree on what they want to do about it. But secondly, the youth vote. If you look at breakdowns of how people voted last night, you'll see that the big parties, the established parties, are starting to lose their younger voters. They're failing to attract new young voters, whilst the Greens um, are attracting considerable support from people under the age of around 30. So there's a lot for Mrs Merkel's government to do if they're to claw back any support. Jenny, thanks very much. Very interesting what's going on there in Germany. So let's take you from Germany over to Italy and we can speak to James Reynolds who's in Milan for us this morning. Morning to you James. Give us a picture from there. Uh, the League Party has won. It's a far-right populist party. It's been uh, in a share of national government since last year. The party, led by Matteo Salvini, the deputy prime minister, got about 34% of the vote. It's fascinating. The League Party began here in northern Italy, hoping to break away from the rest of the country. Then it changed and it decided it wanted to rule the rest of the country. This election shows that it has achieved a dominant position in Italian politics and now Matteo Salvini, the League's leader, wants to have a powerful voice in Europe, in the European Parliament. But he wants to try to put together a group of populists, but they might only amount to about 70, 70 seats in the European Parliament of 751 seats. So he may be a powerful voice in Europe now, but he will not be a dominant voice. He's got to find a way, from his point of view, of putting together populist parties who believe very, very many different things. But it is a win for him, and it shows a new kind of Italy. James, thank you. Right, we've been to Germany, we've been to Italy. Let's go to France, where Hugh Schofield is in Paris. Morning, Hugh. So um, we've got quite an interesting change in picture around um, the EU. What's happened there in France? Well, it's another victory for Marine Le Pen and her national rally party that was the National Front. I say another victory because 2014 they won the European elections um, and that was a huge surprise, less of a surprise now because, of course, we knew that her party, the National Rally, was up there with neck and neck really before the, the, in the last polls uh, with, with Macron's party, the, the uh, Republic en Marche. Um, so a victory for her, a symbolic defeat for Macron in the sense that he laid a lot of store by winning this election, and he, he hasn't. But the mood in Macron's party headquarters is not dejected. Um, and that, uh, in a, in almost they're saying that this is um, not quite a victory, but uh, you know, the news is not bad for them either. When you think about it, uh, ruling governments in, in, in midterm elections like this tend to get thrashed at European elections. He wasn't thrashed. He nearly won this election. Um, and I think what he above all feels, uh, Macron, is that what this election result shows is that his analysis of the European politics is, it remains true, that there is a split between people like him uh, with their centrist liberal ideas and the new nationalist represented by, by Le Pen. So his analysis remains the same. He's up there fighting a one-on-one -on -one battle with her. Mm. OK, Hugh, thanks very much. Hugh Schofield there for us, giving us a picture from Paris and France. Yes, of course, uh, more coverage uh, from the Brexit result itself. We'll keep you up to date on all the results. But interesting what people make of what's happened overnight, if they've heard the results yet. Uh, let's go to a car boot sale in St Coldfield, where Tim is this morning for us right now. Morning to you, Tim. Yeah, good morning to you. West Midlands constituency, an interesting one. Three Brexit MEPs were elected, one Lib Dem, one Labour, one Green, one Conservative. But yes, those three Brexit MEPs really grabbing the headlines and the attention of men amongst many of the, the declutterers and the bargain hunters at the car boot sale here at Lee Marston, just outside Sutton Coalfield, about 10 miles northeast of Birmingham. Uh, Natalie, what did you make of the results? I didn't even follow it. I didn't even know it was on. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think, what does the fact that three Brexit MEPs have been elected, what does that tell us, do you think? I have 
no idea. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even follow it. I don't understand it. It's it's all a bit French to me. So. Okay. French, and German, and Italian, many other languages yeah. as well. Thanks so much, Natalie. Good luck with selling your your stuff. Let's have a quick chat to Paul because I know he was quite in, engaged with what was happening. Paul, what did you make of what's been going on? Uh, well, I was surprised at the results. Not as high as I thought it would be, but it's just a reflection of what the British public wants. And politicians have got to wake up and come out of Europe. And uh, I don't know where this idea of a deal came from. People never voted for a deal. We voted to come out. I think it's another way of politicians just trying to stay in Europe. <laughs> Paul, thanks so much indeed. I'm going to have a quick chat to Jordan as well to try and capture as many uh, voices as we can. Jordan, what did you make of the results of the European elections? Um, the, the, sorry, I haven't been keeping up to date with it, if I'm honest, but I think, you know, what we're seeing is... I think it's kind of race fueled to a degree where we're seeing a lot of people saying they want to leave because of the current racial climate in the country. And that's what I think is the not thing about the economic effect it's going to have. So that's why I think we're seeing, you know, what the, the leavers are winning rather than the remainers. Interesting stuff. Many, many interesting voices. Thank you very much indeed, no Jordan. So as I say, that all morning we've been talking to people, getting their kind of responses to what's been going on and a real sort of selection of views. So it's been very interesting to hear what those people who are out spotting a bargain or two find and make of the European election results. But what we'll do, we'll leave you for now with the, uh, the news, the weather and the travel where you are watching breakfast this morning. Good morning, you're watching Breakfast with Charlie State and Naga Manchetti. Our headlines today. Nigel Farage's Brexit party claims an overwhelming victory, taking the lion's share of the votes across the UK in the European elections. Our primary goal is to get this country to be independent and self-governing. If that doesn't happen, and if we don't leave on the 31st of October, then what you will see is the Brexit party stunning everybody at the next general election. The Conservatives suffer the worst performance since 1832, pushed into fifth place, while Labour is punished for a lack of clarity over Brexit. The Comeback Kids, a surge of support for the Liberal Democrats, which claims second spot, and a victorious night for the Greens, making significant gains. I'm at a bank holiday car boot sale in Sutton Coalfield and we'll be, we've been judging reaction from some of the bargain hunters as to what they think of the European election results. The whole thing's tantamount to a protest vote on behalf of both Remainers and Leavers. I mean, I think everyone's very tired of it and uh, they just wanted to say, we're fed up, do something. It's just gone on and on and on and I don't feel I can trust people anymore and I do, uh, Everybody just seems to be arguing. They don't seem to be trying to deliver what people voted for. In this hour, we're going to hear from key figures from the Labour and Conservative parties about what was a disappointing night. Good morning. In sport, Lewis Hamilton describes his victory in Monaco as the hardest one yet, as he dedicates his fourth win this season to triple world champion Nicky Lauda, who died on Monday. Good morning. It's quite a cloudy start to the day for most of us. Then we're looking at a day of bright spells, sunshine and showers and feeling cooler than yesterday. I'll have all the details in 15 minutes. Good morning. It's Monday the 27th of May. Our top story this morning. Labour and the Conservatives have paid the price for their indecision over Brexit, suffering huge losses in the European elections. The newly formed Brexit party took a 32% share of the vote. The pro-EU Liberal Democrats finished above the Conservative party for the first time ever. So let's take a look at those results in some detail. Nigel Farage's Brexit party formed, you'll remember, just six weeks ago was the runaway winner, gaining 28 seats. At the opposite end of the Brexit divide, it was also a good day for the Liberal Democrats, which now has 15 MEPs. Looking at each party's share of the votes, it's just clear how bad a night it was for the Conservatives, receiving less than 10%, the worst performance in an election since 1832. And take a look at the change in numbers from the last EU elections. You can see just where some of those Brexit party seats came from. Taken nearly all of the UKIP vote, as well as undoubtedly some of that big 15% loss that the Conservatives suffered. Well, let's get a better idea of what the Brexit Party share of the vote looks like across the UK. 
Now, you see the image we have here, uh, huge swathes of teal, that, of course, representing Nigel Farage's party across England and Wales. In Scotland, the SNP in yellow comes out on top overall. No results from Northern Ireland yet. Counting there has just got underway. And if you want to follow these results in more detail, find out what happened where you are. Full coverage on the BBC News Channel. Our political correspondent Nick Hurdley has a roundup of the results so far. His report does contain some flashing images. A vote that wasn't supposed to take place to a parliament we're supposed to have left. A result that shows the country is still bitterly divided. The big winners, two parties with very different but very clear messages on Brexit. Brexit, Brexit now! Nigel Farage's Brexit party topped the poll with almost a third of the vote. The reason, of course, is very obvious. We voted to leave in a referendum. We were supposed to do so on March the 29th, and we haven't. The Liberal Democrats, with their anti-Brexit message, had a big night too, coming second across the UK. Every vote for the Liberal Democrats is a vote to stop Brexit. For the two parties that normally dominate British politics, it was a disaster. The Conservatives were thumped, finishing fifth with less than 10% of the vote. Three years ago, the country voted to leave. It's three years on and we haven't left. And inevitably, therefore, people were going to be drawn in a polarised way to the kind of single-issue pro- or anti-Brexit parties. Labour too were punished, finishing third with less than 15%. That'll spark a heated debate about whether it should now get fully behind another referendum. We're now going to find ourselves in a position where we will have a Tory leadership who will insist on either a bad deal or no deal at all. And I fear it will be no deal. And in those circumstances, we must be equally clear. And it will be a disaster for our country to have no deal. There should be a referendum and we should campaign to remain. <laughs> The Green vote was up too. They beat the Conservatives into fourth place. UKIP were wiped out and Change UK failed to make their mark. In Scotland, the SNP were miles ahead on almost 40%. The party will take three of the six seats there. In Wales, the Brexit party topped the poll. Plaid Cymru came second. Labour, a party who have dominated Welsh politics for a century, finished third. Northern Ireland counts today. It was a good night for parties who have taken a firm stand on Brexit, but voters are still split between parties who back leaving the EU as soon as possible and those who want another referendum and ultimately to stay. If you were hoping this would end the Brexit debate, you may well be disappointed. McKerry, BBC News. So let's pick up on some of the social media reaction to the results overnight. Now, Nigel Farage, who we spoke to earlier on this programme, um, he tweeted to say that his Brexit party's result today could be repeated at a general election if Britain does not leave the EU by the end of October, the end date of Theresa May's extension, which was, of course, agreed in March. So he has said history has been made. This is just the beginning. Former Labour spin doctor Alistair Campbell admitted to turning away from his staunch Labour roots uh, to vote for the Liberal Democrats. Uh, sorry, that was the wrong uh, tweet you can see up there. That's the Nicola Sturgeon tweet you can see there. She said the SNP's dominance in Scotland uh, shows the country has rejected Brexit again. There's and, Alistair Campbell. Yeah, then you can see uh, Alistair Campbell there. Of course, uh, he, he said that this time he voted Lib Dem. Yeah, for the first time ever, he didn't vote for Labour. He says, I'm not a Lib Dem, I'm Labour, and I hope that in voting as I did, I will help the Labour Party see sense and do the right thing for the country. And then he's tagged people's vote. Well, let's talk to our political correspondent, Tom Barton, who joins us from Westminster. It's interesting, isn't it, um, how all this is going to pan out for the future of um, UK politics? Because even though it's the EU elections, I think very much reflecting on the frustrations in the UK. Absolutely, Naga, that's, that's right, without question. This was a terrible night for the two main parties. Uh, between them, Labour and the Conservatives polled fewer than half as many votes as they did back in 2014. The big winners, as we've been seeing, were the Brexit party. Nigel Farage today saying that his party would fight a general election if Brexit doesn't happen.
Much more change needed in British politics. The two-party system isn't fit for purpose. There are institutions like the House of Lords uh, that frankly have become an absolute parody of themselves. There's a lot of work to do beyond Brexit to modernise and change the shape of British politics. But our primary goal is to get this country to be independent and self-governing. If that doesn't happen, and if we don't leave on the 31st of October, then what you will see is the Brexit party stunning everybody at the next general election. What voters thought, though, actually is far from clear, because while the Brexit party did well, parties that stood on a clear Remain platform, the Lib Dems, uh, the Green Party, Change UK, the Scottish and Welsh Nationalists, between them, they got more votes than the Brexit party. What then does this mean for politics here in Westminster? Well, up until now, Labour and the Conservatives have both been uh, walking the line of compromise on Brexit. It seems pretty clear that voters don't like that. And so for the Tories, well, in the middle of a leadership election, the likelihood is that's going to put pressure on candidates to uh, flag up their Brexit credentials to move towards a harder Brexit. As for Labour, well, it's going to put pressure on the leadership there to uh, move towards backing another referendum. For both parties, though, those changes really risk alienating large parts of their electorate. This election really doesn't give any easy way out of the Brexit challenge for the two big parties. Mm. OK, Tom, thanks very much. Yes, yeah, just a reminder, uh, speaking to all the main parties this morning, in a few minutes speaking to the Conservative MP and Brexiteer, Steve Baker, about those uh, very, very poor results for the Conservative Party. Now, early indications from the European parliamentary elections suggest a fall in support for established centrist parties. As there have been gains for those on the left and right, as well as the Greens, a voter turnout was sharply up on the last elections. Let's head to Brussels now. Let's speak to our Europe correspondent, Damien Grammaticus. Uh, Damien, we've been concentrating for the last, what, uh, 10 minutes or so on what's happened here. Tell us the picture across the rest of Europe. Well, some highlights. So, turnout, yes, above 50%, highest for 20 years. That's 200 million people voted across Europe. So, a sign here they think that people are really engaging again with European issues and EU sort of level issues uh, are at stake. So, uh, voters definitely taking part. Those big parties, as you were saying, centre-right, uh, centre-left, the socialists and the sort of centre-right conservatives both saw their share slip. They used to have a more than half of the chamber here for the first time falling below that, but they still remain number one and number two in the parties. The nationalist, populist, far-right sort of wave that was being predicted, well, that hasn't actually quite happened. They did very well in Italy, but their allies elsewhere, not so well. In France, Marine Le Pen topped the poll, but no real momentum for her there off the back of all of those gilets jaunes protests. And far-right parties in smaller countries, uh, in Finland, Denmark, the Netherlands, not doing very well at all. So not really capitalising. And those Eurosceptics look like they will remain split into different competing camps in the parliament here. They won't have a third of seats, as some predicted, perhaps, but they might have a, a quarter but rivals are so unable to cooperate, probably. The real uh, winners out of it look a little bit to be the Greens, who had successes right across uh, Europe, and the Liberals on the back of Emmanuel Macron holding on to almost uh, the same sort of vote share as Marine Le Pen in France, and, of course, the Liberals in the UK. They may well, in the centre, still hold that sort of centre together. David, thank you very much uh, for that. And just worth saying, we'll be speaking to uh, the Conservative Party and Labour Party in the next sort of 20, 25 minutes or so. That's coming up. Time now is 13 minutes past eight. So this morning, the Conservative leadership candidate, Boris Johnson, has said the party risks being dismissed if it does not deliver Brexit. Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt says the party faces an existential risk over Brexit. Let's talk to Conservative MP Steve Baker, who joins us now from Westminster. Good morning. Do you disagree with either of those comments, Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson? No, I agree with them both. I mean, I tweeted out that we face obliteration if we don't now exit the European Union. And I'm afraid uh, we've lost some excellent MEPs, some really experienced people who didn't deserve to lose. I mean, they shouldn't have been standing, but um, I'm very sorry that they've lost their seats. OK. Are you surprised with just um, the drubbing the Conservatives have um, received in the EU elections? 
Of course, this is the worst result we've ever had in the history of the Conservative Party. It's a very serious, it's a grave even, time for our party and our country. Um, I'm not surprised that it's as bad as it is. You just can't break promises you've made uh, like this and expect to go unpunished. OK, so who or what is next for the Conservative Party in terms of recovering? Who, well, first of all, you need to get a new leader. Who's that going to be to bring the votes back? Well, it's got to be somebody who seriously believes in leaving the European Union and making a success of it, who has a clear plan to do it, and who is capable of lifting the spirits of the nation and, and getting on with it. It's also got to be somebody who's willing to plant a flag and say this is what's right. I mean, of course, compromise where compromise is possible, but at this point, what I think we'll see is the debate crystallising between those who are willing to take us out, even if that means no withdrawal agreements and going on to WTO terms versus those who are flirting with revoke or indefinite extension, uh, which would be a miserable place for our country. So uh, at this point, I don't want to name a candidate. It's very clear that Boris Johnson is the uh, leading candidate, followed up by uh, Dominic Raab. But uh, at this point, I don't want to uh, support one candidate. Are you considering running? Well, as I've said over the weekend, people are pressing on me that I should consider it. Uh, my odds shortened from 151 to 25 to 1 on Friday, so obviously I've got to take it seriously. But I'm very, very conscious that we don't want an enormous plethora of Eurosceptic candidates dividing the vote in Parliament. So I'm going to talk to the other two, uh, the two leading candidates over the next few days and see how events work out. Do you think the Conservative Party can, can promise that um, the UK is not going to leave the EU without a deal? At this point, I think we need to decide what we're about and who our voters are and what we wish this country to become and then deliver it. I, I, we're kind of beyond the point at which talk is enough. We've actually got to do, you know, less talk, more action. We've got to take this country out of the EU and we've got to do it at the end of October. And certainly everyone is going to need to unite around that idea. I would just say at this point, for Conservative, especially MPs, also the DUP, we've got to stay in power and that means everybody deciding that they're going to rise to the historic challenge that's been laid before them, the burden on their shoulders, as it were. And that means thinking extremely seriously about what they say in media appearances like this and not, for example, threatening to bring down the government over something which Parliament has already legislated for and which was, until recently, government policy. Um, we've spoken to Sal Brinton from Lib Dems um, this morning and um, she said... We have a cabinet and a government that is totally split. That's been clear for ages. Parliament is too. Nigel Farage um, has said that the Conservative Party is going to descend into chaos um, because of Brexit. And um, you haven't delivered an orderly Brexit. Why cling on to power at the moment? Why not go to general election? Well, the alternative to the Conservative Party governing this country is Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell governing the country, and that would be a disaster. I mean, the idea... But you're not that, doing a very good job of it at the moment, are you? Well, at the moment, if people look at the economy, the economy's doing perfectly well, thank you. We've just had our GDP Brexit, figures uh, revised up, Germany's revised down. So many of the things which were forecast that would happen if we voted to leave have not happened, in quite, fact, quite the reverse. Now, there's no denying that this is a major rolling political crisis, but the, the idea that it extends to the rest of our society and our economy is, is for the birds. So... We well, actually, are actually the Bank of England governing this country. The Bank of England governor has warned about the impact of Brexit, and we've heard countless industry leaders, business leaders, warn about the impact in, of Brexit and seeing deals put off. So actually, it is affecting the economy. This indecision well, and this this lack of ownership of Brexit and getting it over the line. So, being on the Treasury Select Committee, I'm well aware of the parameters of debate, but I think it's a matter of fact where the numbers are that have been issued, where the forecasts have been going, their direction of travel. But there's no doubt that as history is being made here, as we go through this in incredible constitutional change, there, are, there is going to be some inconvenience. There's no way of getting away from that. But what we see in this devastating result for the Conservative Party, losing so many good candidates, is that the public want us to keep our promises and take this country out of the EU. And that is going to require every member of Parliament to decide for what they stand and whether they're willing to stand firm and resolute and do what is necessary. Steve Baker from the Conservative Party, thank you for talking to us this morning. You're welcome. 22 minutes past eight is the time. The outcome of the European elections has reaffirmed a deep divide between supporters and opponents of the country's planned exit from the European Union. So has the Brexit debate re-engaged voters? Vicky Holland has been at a count in Manchester to find out. Manchester on a bank holiday. The sunshine giving the city a continental feel. But Europe and the European elections wasn't everybody's focus. To be honest, I don't know what the election's for. Is it for Brexit? <laughs> 
really? No, is it? It's to elect our MEPs. No, I'm not, I don't really mind about the result. I cared about Brexit, but not, like, who's in Parliament. Yeah. I didn't vote on Thursday. Uh, the reason why, because we're leaving, um, you know, Europe and Brexit, I didn't see the point. Last time it kind of passed me by a bit, really, so um, I felt like I had to do my duty and, and make sure I voted and got my point across. In Manchester's former Central Railway station, the count got underway. The North West was previously split into loyal Labour heartlands, rural Conservative voters and strong support for UKIP. No more. I therefore declare that the following candidates have been duly elected to the North West electoral region. Claire Regina Fox, the Brexit Party. This time it was the Brexit Party who took the most seats, with UKIP nowhere to be seen. None of us were aware that we were standing four weeks ago, so it has been incredible. And, and I really do think it's, it's partly because the organisation of the Brexit Party, but it actually also is because people are really angry. The Conservatives ended up with no MEPs at all. For those working at grassroots level, it's a hard result to swallow. We've got a lot of flack on the doorstep with regards to what's going on in Westminster. And a lot of people saying that why should they vote? Because not, it's not democracy anymore, is it? So it's a lot of people feel very disenfranchised with politics at the moment. And even in the Labour heartlands of Manchester, the candidates were punished. A disappointment that we haven't got three. We've got to re-engage with people that voted Remain. We've got to re-engage with people that voted Leave. But for the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, it was a night to celebrate. I have been a Trafford councillor for 19 years. I've been active in the Liberal Democrats for most of my life. It's an amazing time. It's an absolute honour to be elected to represent the region. And I am, yeah, I'm just so, so pleased that the voters in the North West have put their faith in the Green Party. Here in the North West, like much of the country, it is the traditional parties who have suffered, Labour and the Conservatives. The Conservatives completely wiped out here. It is the Brexit Party who have taken three of the seats, but the Liberal Democrats have also done better than ever before, winning two seats in the North West. And with some parties suggesting a general election is the only way to solve the problem of Brexit, the two big parties will have to work hard to clean up. Victoria Holland, BBC News, Manchester. Time now is 25 minutes past eight. Um, shall we go to a car boot sale? You like a car boot sale. Bank holiday Monday, what could be better? Just picking around some stuff and having a chat about politics. <laughs> I bet all those people there, a little bit mystified. They thought they were going to a car boot sale, to Tim, to pick up an old uh, DVD or something like that, and they find you asking questions about the EU elections. I know, Sutton <laughs> Coalfield, of all places. I know. It's good to surprise people, isn't it? As you say, lots of bargain hunters here, lots of declutterers, getting some reaction to the European elections. Bev, what did you make of what happened? I just wish we'd hurry and get on and then get out of Brexit and let us be our own country again. Um, there's so much, many things here that need looking at, homelessness. We don't need to be paying for other countries. OK, good result for the Brexit party, as we heard, and, and Bev, you seem to support that. I'm going to have a quick chat to Lorraine as well, Lorraine and her lovely dog, Ralph. Lorraine, what did you think? Well, to be honest, I used to be really into like politics and voting and think that it was really, really important because you can't moan about what's going on in the country if you don't like, you know, vote. But like since what's happened with the elections and like with Brexit and everything, you know, we voted for what we wanted. We was passionate about it and nothing's happened. It's been over two years now. Lorraine, I'm going to have to interrupt you there, I'm afraid. And I love your snake if you okay, bought a little earlier. Okay. Let's have a quick look at the news weather and the travel where you are this morning. Hello, welcome back. You're watching Breakfast with Charlie States and Nagat Manchetti. Time's just turned 8.30. Let's bring you right up to date with the European elections. Nigel Farage's new Brexit party has dealt a huge blow to the Conservatives and Labour in the European parliamentary elections. The party's won 28 seats out of the 64 declared so far, almost a third of the vote across Britain. Earlier, Nigel Farage told this programme that British politics needs a complete overhaul. 
there is much more change needed in British politics. The two-party system isn't fit for purpose. There are institutions like the House of Lords uh, that, frankly, have become an absolute parody of themselves. There's a lot of work to do beyond Brexit to modernise and change the shape of British politics. But our primary goal is to get this country to be independent and self-governing. If that doesn't happen, and if we don't leave on the 31st of October, then what you will see is the Brexit Party stunning everybody at the next general election. The Conservatives and Labour suffered heavy losses. The Tories came fifth behind the Green Party, its worst election results since 1832. Early on breakfast, Conservative Brexiteer Steve Baker said his party accepted defeat. We face obliteration if we don't now exit the European Union and I'm afraid uh, we've lost some excellent MEPs, some really experienced people who didn't deserve to lose. I mean, they shouldn't have been standing, but um, I'm very sorry that they've lost their seats. It was a good night for the Liberal Democrats, though. The pro-Remain party won in London and came second overall, gaining 15 seats in the European Parliament. Northern Ireland and Scotland still to finalise their results. Was a disappointing night for the pro Remain MPs in Change UK. Uh, you'll remember it launched initially as the independent group in February, receiving just 3% of the votes. Even before the results were announced, the party's leader Heidi Allen suggested a merger with the Liberal Democrats could be on the cards. So let's talk now to Change UK MP Anna Subri. Very good morning to you. Thank you for your time this morning. Just first of all, I mean, tell us your reaction to how your party fared. Look, I mean, let's get some facts out there, shall we? So the turnout was 38%, and 600,000 people were good enough to go out and vote for Change UK, a new political party, I mean, a genuinely new political party, formed only a few weeks ago. And we fielded 69 excellent candidates, so my view is that that is a fantastic start to our party and for our future and more to come. Because I have to say, I mean, this is a bit of a shock, I do agree with Nigel. Farage. We do need to change British politics and you know, British politics at the moment is broken. I take the view that that includes all the main political parties. He is not, most definitely, not the answer. But I think the sensible, moderate, centrist policies that I believe in, the values and principles of Change UK, actually are the future. And I think millions of people in this country feel that nobody represents them and that's what we seek to do, to represent those people. Yeah, I mean, your first answer, you were talking about you were new, you've just been formed. I mean, there is a, another new uh, party on the block, as it were, that's the Brexit Party. Six weeks they've been running, and look at their results. Look, it's, uh, hello, excuse me. Uh, Brexit Party is not a new party. It's just a Nigel Farage retread. His party was formed about 20 years ago and it just comes along in different guises. Uh, that's the reality of that. No, we are 11 members of parliament that came from two political parties. We came together. We formed this new political party, a genuinely new political party with a new approach to doing politics. And I'm, I'm very pleased that 600,000 people were good enough to go out and give us our support. I mean, if you look at at that in terms of core vote and then compare it to the Conservatives at 9% and then the Labour Party at what, 11, 12%? That's their core vote. I think there's much hope for our future and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, does the future involve uh, some kind of a link up with the Lib Dems who have uh, increased, you know, they, they have had a spectacular night themselves. So oh, are yes, you closer well. to coming to some kind of arrangement with them? Look, full credit to the Lib Dems, they've had a super night. I mean, they managed to attract both Alistair Campbell, Tony Blair's spin doctor, and Michael Heseltine to vote for them. It's a, a, it was a repository for many of those people who support a people's vote. And by the way, the people's vote uh, parties actually polled at 40% as opposed to the hard Brexit party that, parties that polled at 35%. And I think that's an important statistic as well. Look, if I wanted to join the Lib Dems, I'd have joined them in February. My values and principles remain the same and I left the Conservative Party because that party had shifted and you'll see an even greater shift over to the right and you're going to see a hard no-deal Brexiteer win the Premiership. So, sorry, are you saying no, no deal with the Lib Dems for the foreseeable future well, in any kind of capacity, some kind of a link-up mm. over principles or you let know, me, voting? Let me please just, I'm so sorry, let me just finish my point. I mean, I worked with the Lib Dems when I was in government uh, during that 2010-15. I have a lot of respect and admiration for people 
people like Joe Swinson and Vince Cable. And of course, we already work with them on all number of issues. We've been working, for example, on the People's Vote. It was founded by Chukaramuna, then in the Labour Party, me and the Tory Party, Leila Moran from the Lib Dems, and Caroline Lucas from the Greens. So absolutely, we've always worked. I've always worked with the Lib Dems. That sort of problem. But if people, other people, want to go and join the Lib Dems, you know, good luck to them. But uh, I believe that British politics is broken. We need to fix it, and that's what Change UK is all about. It's about that sensible, moderate, progressive, centrist voice finding a home in a political party that's new, fresh, will look and base its policies on evidence, not ideology. Can I just and ask I you one, that is us. one more thing, if I may? I mean, some things haven't changed remotely uh, as a result of this vote, and that is October the 31st, we leave, deal or no deal, according to the law. Now, I mean, this doesn't change anything, does it? Well, as you make a very good point, which is now let's look to the future. Uh, and what do we take out of these election results? And you're absolutely right. At the moment, we are set to leave the European Union on October the 31st. And I think there is no debate that the next leader of the Conservative Party is going to be somebody who has no qualms at all of taking this country out without a deal. The one thing that the British people were promised would not happen by the Leave campaign, who told all manners of falsehoods and so on and so forth. And they were clear uh, in their campaign that we would not leave the European Union without a deal. The new leader, the new Prime Minister of the Conservative Party, is set to do that, in my opinion. That will be a national emergency. And I am very clear that because we haven't got time to have that people's vote, then we must revoke Article 50, which means that we must stop Brexit. Then we must have that people's vote, which I believe increasingly the majority of people in this country now see as the only way through the impasse. And I think that's one of the big messages that have come out from this election. First of all, as I, I heard a woman, I think, in Sutton Coalfield saying that she was fed up to the back teeth with Brexit and she felt let down by the main political parties, and she's right to feel that. People People are fed up uh, with Brexit. They are deeply, profoundly disillusioned with the two main parties. But that great division still exists in our country about our future and Brexit. And the only way to resolve it ultimately is to have that people's vote. But if it comes to October and no deal, then I have no doubt at all we must revoke because to leave without a deal would be disastrous for our country. Those aren't my words. Those are actually the views of the current business secretary of state in the Conservative government. Anna Subri, thank you very much for your time this morning. It's Anna Subri, uh, of course, from the Change UK party. 22 minutes to nine is the time. Um, let's go to Scotland. All but one of the seats there have been declared. The SNP is on course to increase its number of MEPs. Lorna Gordon is there for us. Morning, Lorna. Yeah, good morning. You know, when the Brexit party is uh, dominated elsewhere, it's a very different story here in Scotland. The SNP's clear, unequivocal message that Scotland's for Europe seems to have hit home. They've increased their overall share of the vote. They're on course for their best ever European election results. They topped the poll in 29 of the 31 council areas declared so far. In fact, in some council areas like Dundee, they were 30 points clear of their nearest rivals. They are on on course to up their share of the MEP seats from two to the three of the six available. The leader of the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon, has called this an historic victory, with Scotland rejecting Brexit again. Uh, the Brexit party, which came second across Scotland, is on course to secure one MEP, as are both the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives. The Tories, nothing to write home about, really, although their vote did hold up better here than in the rest of the UK. For Labour, though, it was a dismal showing here in Scotland. Five years ago, they came a close second. I think this time around, their vote really did collapse. Uh, they secured less than 10% of uh, the vote. The Western Isles still to declare, of course, they don't count on a Sunday for reasons of religious observance, but that result due in uh, just before midday. But really, here in Scotland, the SNP carried the vote and the SNP leader, Westminster leader Ian Blackford, suggesting the result has cemented its case for a second referendum on independence in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Mm. Lorna, thanks very much. Lorna Gordon there for us. 43 is the time now. So we're looking at uh, those uh, results from the uh, EU vote and uh, some senior Labour figures this morning calling for an urgent change in the party's Brexit policy.
after what's been called disastrous EU election results. Let's talk to the Shadow Justice Secretary Richard Bergen, who's in Leeds for us today. Good morning. Poor, morning what a wake-up call for the Labour Party. Morning. Morning. Yeah, it's... Um, I'm not on here to pretend it's been anything other than a deeply disappointing uh, night for the Labour Party in these European Union uh, elections. The Conservatives got their worst vote for 200 years and we're back, disappointingly, to around about the vote share we got in the 2009 European Union elections. I do think that the European Union uh, election is very different from uh, the next general election and hopefully that will come uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, but but I think surely you're not, you're not going to dismiss this as not having any reflection on how the UK feels about or how voters feel about the Labour Party? Of course I'm not going to dismiss it and it's important that uh, we uh, listen. It's important that discussions take place uh, across the Labour Party and across uh, the country. But in relation to directly using the EU elections to predict the next general election, I think history shows that that doesn't really work. For example, in 2014, Nigel Farage's UKIP came top in the uh, EU elections, but then only got one member of parliament in the general election the year after. Fair and to I say, though, we're in very different times, aren't we? Brexit hadn't happened then. Brexit hadn't um, bored and frustrated the electorate in a way it has now. And it also, we, you didn't have a Labour Party which had said, which his, whose leader had said, it would bring the divided country together. He hasn't done that. The Labour Party hasn't done that. Well, it became a, a bit of a proxy referendum, albeit on a much, much lower turnout, either than the referendum or uh, a general election. And understandably, and quite rightly, people feel very strongly. Uh, and obviously, there's a great attraction to the polarised views in this proxy referendum that took place, whether people wanted leave uh, on the basis of a hard no-deal Brexit or whether they uh, wanted uh, to remain. I do think a general election will be different, but what we've got to make clear is that the threat of a no-deal Brexit and all the damage that will cause to jobs in the economy <coughs> is becoming more likely. So we need a general election or uh, a public vote in order to stop the kind of disastrous no-deal Brexit that Boris Johnson and other right-wings in the Conservative Party will be pushing more and more. You used the phrase, what we need to make clear. I mean, the problem is with the Labour Party, it hasn't made itself clear, has it, on its position when it comes to Brexit? I mean, Tom Watson has said Labour is rightly calling for a general election, but we can't go into an election with our current Brexit position. You haven't made clear what you want. You haven't made clear when it comes to a people's referendum and what you would do in the case of no deal. We'll use any mechanism in order to stop either a disastrous Tory Brexit, the kind that Boris Johnson and others will push, or a disastrous no deal Brexit. Every mechanism means either a vote of no confidence uh, in the new Prime Minister, a general election, or yes, a public vote. So we would support a public vote in order to stop um, a disastrous no-deal uh, Brexit or a, a bad Tory Brexit. If I asked you if Labour's a Remain or a Leave party, what would you tell me? Well, we're a party that wants to bring the country together. I don't think that's a message which was uh, going to work well in a kind of proxy second referendum which the EU election uh, turned into. I think at a general election that will uh, work well. I don't understand that your answer. Are, are you a Remain or a Leave party? Well, we're a party that's going to uh, bring uh, the country together. In the last general election, uh, we said we accepted and respected the outcome of the referendum. At the referendum, we campaigned to uh, remain uh, and reform the European Union. In terms of the next general election, our policy will be decided as a democratic party uh, in the usual way. But what I can uh, be abundantly clear on now, even before that democratic process of drawing up the next manifesto uh, takes place, is that we will use any mechanism to stop a no-deal Brexit or a bad Tory Brexit, and that includes, that includes a public vote. But I think that all opposition parties need to step up to the plate to communicate to the public where opinion is really polarising, as the EU election results show, on what we should do about the uh, 2016 EU referendum. Uh, we need to really step up to the plate across the opposition okay. parties and make clear exactly what a no-deal yeah, Brexit you're is. Saying what you exactly said earlier. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you. Richard Berg and Shadow Justice Secretary joining us there. Thank you. 848. So, with uncertainty still surrounding Brexit, the European Parliament would have been casting a keen eye over last night's UK vote. How is the EU reacting to Nigel Farage's victory? What does this mean for the traditional parties? We've been talking to them all this morning. Yes, we'll be speaking to EU analyst Jackie Davis from Brussels in just a moment. First, though, 
Let's get some wise words from the polling expert, uh, Sir John Curtis. Very good morning to you, John. Uh, I know morning. you've been up all night and it's been a very long time for you. Give us uh, your snapshot. What do we learn from these votes that were cast? We've basically learned that the UK electorate is deeply polarised over Brexit. Um, we've seen the electorate move in favour of parties that either are willing to contemplate no deal, principally Nigel Farage's Brexit party, or parties that want to have another referendum unambiguously, unlike Richard Bergen, um, such as the Liberal Democrats and the Greens. Two forces, roughly equal in size, but representing very, very different views to the public. And what's fascinating about this election is how these two views, which have long looked like the two most popular views in the British public, that these are the views that voters have been wanted to express, rather than saying, oh, well, maybe we should give Mrs May's deal a chance, or maybe a Labour alternative Brexit would be better. These compromise positions, these fudge positions, or the inability to deliver positions have been widely rejected, and instead voters have wanted to express their very clear and very polarised views. The implication, therefore, for the European Union is if you think the UK has got any closer to resolving its Brexit impasse as a result of holding the European elections that you insisted the country should hold, the answer to that is no. Probably it's made the impasse more difficult to resolve rather than any easier. And, John, what, what, are, what are the implications uh, for the, the, well, I call them the major parties, but this, this election slightly lends a light to that. Well, Conservatives and Labour, what do they take from this? Well, I mean, the truth is the Conservative Party has to work out how it's going to get those lost Leave voters back. I think the key message probably is the depth of the rebellion against the Conservative position, the support for Nigel Farage, uh, indicates that probably the Conservative Party has to deliver a Brexit before it can contemplate a general election because too many of these voters would probably carry on voting for Nigel Farage. In the general election, the opinion polls certainly suggest that around half of them would. And that therefore means that the next Tory Prime Minister faces this difficult task of how to get a deal through uh, through a House of Commons that so far whose arithmetic has made this very difficult. On the Labour side, I think it's going to open up a debate inside the party about whether or not it needs to shift in favour of a less ambiguous position on Brexit because the truth is, at the moment, ambiguity simply means you lose the support of both sides in the debate. John, good talking to you this morning. Thank you very much. Get some sleep. Uh, I know you've, you've definitely earned it. Uh, let's get a little of the mood in Brussels today. Jackie Davis is a leading commentator on EU affairs there for us right now. Morning to you, Jackie. Well, I mean, uh, of course, we are fascinated by what's happening here. There's a bigger picture as well across the whole of Europe. Uh, tell us some of your thoughts. Well, I think in terms of the bigger picture, we've seen a, a much less dramatic, but a similar trend in one sense across Europe, with mainstream traditional parties not doing as well as they have in the past. But the prediction had been a far-right populist surge right across Europe. In fact, what happened is much more nuanced than that. We saw voters leaving those mainstream parties, but going not just to far-right populist in some countries, uh, but to the Greens, to the Liberals. So the picture across Europe is a more fragmented European Parliament. It's going to be a noisy Parliament, and one of the noisiest elements within that could indeed be Nigel Farage. And I think Sir John Curtis absolutely right there when he says the message that Brussels is taking away from what happened in the UK last night was this doesn't make Brexit uh, any easier to solve and indeed probably makes it harder. So a good deal of dismay on both counts, I think, uh, around the corridors of the European Parliament and the other EU institutions today. Yeah, as you mentioned Nigel Farage, of course, uh, in that chamber, in the EU chamber, as and when that happens, if it happens, there are lots of issues there, but he'll be backed up by a lot more Brexit MEPs. <laughs> Certainly he will. He'll be, in fact, the singest uh, party block, uh, national party block that there is. Uh, the question is, what does he do with it? Does he focus all his attention on getting the UK out uh, of the EU? Or does he, as he, as he has done in the past, use it to make more noise? He can't really disrupt EU business. Pro-European forces still have a majority. The two biggest parties can't do it on their own anymore. But there's a very strong pro-European flavour to this new European Parliament. So there'll be a limit to what he can do. Uh, uh, but as I say, really the concern will be about what this means uh, for Brexit uh, and for an orderly departure of the UK. Jackie, thank you very much for your time this morning. Good talking to you. It's been a good day for politics. Uh, seven minutes uh, to nine. Let's see what the weather's looking like at a car boot sale in Sutton Coalfield. That's where Tim is for us right now. Morning to you, Tim.
Yeah, good morning to you. Many, many bargain hunters out this morning. Many, many declutterers trying to get rid of some of their stuff as well. Some person's junk is another person's treasure, of course, as the old saying goes. And we are here gauging reaction to the European election results. The West Midlands constituency where we are, three Brexit MEPs elected, one Labour, one Lib Dem, one Green and one Conservative. So an interesting result. Let's have a quick chat to Bob and Sally, your brother and sister. You've come here a few times over the years, haven't you? Bob, what did you make of the uh, election results? I thought the election results were uh, on the cards as to have it turned out with the, um, a protest vote against the Conservatives and the Labour Party. Is that what this was, do you think, a protest? I think it was a protest vote. Yes, I think uh, that's why the Greens and the Repretics Party uh, and the Lib Dems have, uh, have coined most of the, of the votes. But I think when it comes to a general election, that won't be the case that uh, people will revert back to the two main parties. Sally, how about you? Um, well, I didn't vote, deliberately didn't um, vote in the European elections because I, mean, I, I voted to stay in, but the vote was to leave, and as such, we will leave, I would have thought. Um, you know, it's a democratic... Uh, it was a democratic vote, and um, so... And as, as Bob said, I think it, it is a protest vote, and um, really, Nigel Farage... I can't quite see it myself. Yeah, interesting stuff, isn't it? So many opinions. Thank you very much indeed, Bob and Sally. Enjoy the rest of your browsing this morning. Yeah, a lot of people we've been speaking to this morning, a real range of opinions. And clearly the main story here in the West Midlands and right across the country, of course, is the very, very good results for the Brexit parties. Three MEPs elected in the West Midlands constituency. Tim, thanks so much. Now that's it from Breakfast for us today. We'll be back with you tomorrow from six. Time now for Britain's secret charity cheats.